what we would call it, the remembering who Christ is as sovereign and coming to rule over his kingdom on this earth, by the way. People have all sorts of weird ideas of what the kingdom is and isn't. Uh, scripture, the idea of a, of a purely spiritual kingdom is, is foreign to Scripture. If God had told David, David, you'll have a spiritual heir to rule over a spiritual throne in a spiritual place, David would have gone, huh? Jesus is the heir. His kingdom will be real and literal on this earth. It's important, of course, that we believe in Jesus as Savior, right? Y'all have all done that. We've, we've been over this. You believe in Jesus for eternal life? You're going to heaven when you die. You're justified is what we would call it. That's very, very important. That's the most important thing that you can do in this life. But Jesus came that we might have life in him. Without him, you know, without that, uh, we'd all be dead, right? We'd all be dead in our trespasses and sins. That's about as dead as dead can be without Jesus. Uh, but Jesus is king. And trying to rule over dead subjects, well, that doesn't work out too well. What are you the king of, right? So let's look at 1 Corinthians. Uh, I'm actually in 1 Thessalonians here. Still in Sunday school. 1 Corinthians 15. It's a long chapter. We're going to look at just eight verses in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So now right before this is a, is a verse that you probably know pretty well. We talk about it at, at Easter. Some people prefer to call it Resurrection Sunday. You call it what you will. We'll know that we're talking about the same thing, right? Okay, we're not going to smack each other around over terminology, really. You hear about this verse a lot at that time. Verse 19 says that if we have believed, or we have hoped in Christ, excuse me, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Right? He's talking about the resurrection, the, the resurrection to life there. And this is Paul's answer, starting in verse 20. To that hypothetical situation. But now indeed, he says, but now in fact, the, all, the extreme opposite is true. Maybe it would be a way that you would say that. I'm not sure how you would make it the strongest possible contrast that you could make. But he says, now indeed, this is an incontrovertible fact that Christ has been raised from the dead, that he is alive. And as such, Paul says he is the first fruit of those who are asleep. It's a picture of being physically dead. Paul uses that image. If you were here in Sunday school, I'll put a plug in here. There are two different words used for being asleep. One means dead in the ground, buried. One means groggy, spiritually lethargic. Here he's talking about the one that is buried in the ground. Not like in 1 Thessalonians 5 that we talked about this morning earlier. He draws us in now with, a, with an Old Testament picture, uh, an Old Testament picture of the first fruits sacrifice, right? Uh, here and there we talk about that. See, I, I'm, I'm not actually an agrarian. I, I'm not an agricultural engineer, as they say in the politically correct word. In Texas, we would say, I am all hat and no cattle. In fact, Rudy has a hat this morning and I don't. Where, you got your hat there, Rudy? That one won't even fit me because I have the world's largest head. Uh, I am actually not an agriculturalist, right? But I know this much. When I look at the first fruits, it's an amazing picture. You understand, like, you know what the tithe was? There's a tithe in, in Scripture. 10% of this was supposed to be given to the Lord for the support of the Levites to serve. This was not a percentage offering. This was not a, a giving of, of a certain portion of the proceeds of something. It was... In fact, the first fruits, when they would go out into the field and they would take the first harvest, the, what, the first fruit of that harvest, it, it was 100%. They would stop and bring this first fruits in at the time. They were not 
to bring it in either way. You know, they, they didn't just bring it in, throw it on the floor, and run back out to finish the harvest either. You know what they're supposed to do? They're supposed to take their first fruits, bring it into the temple, and they're supposed to take an extra Sabbath day when they brought it in. Take a day off. Now, I told you, I'm not a farmer. Um, I'm not even a, a rancher. I'm, I'm nothing like that, but I know this. Once you start harvesting, there's no days off. Not normally. Y'all know this, right? Have, have you observed this? Are you related to anybody that does this? Yeah. When, you're worried. If it's time to, to harvest hay, you don't want it to rain, right? Otherwise, you've got compost in a bunch of bales. You've got problems. But God said, listen, you rest in this knowledge. You bring in the first fruits. You take a day off. In this agrarian culture, he says, you believe me, trust me. It, it was an expression of God's goodness that he would provide everything they needed for life and rest in that fact. It's counter to every natural intuition a farmer would have, I think. A good farmer, right? Proverbs draws a distinction between a lazy one and a, and a good one, but a, a good farmer, a responsible one. Uh, the closest I ever came was my, my dad was a meat cutter. And I don't remember ever, well, there, Kevin's doing this this morning, isn't he? Got a deer hanging up, ready to go. You don't quarter the thing and then leave it in your garage <laughs> for a day. <laughs> not normally. Not unless it's real cold outside. Not in Texas. Not anywhere in Texas we don't do that. It's counter. Once you start, you finish normally. God instructed them to bring in that first fruits and then rest in him. Paul says Christ is that. He's the guarantee. He's the expression of that confidence that we can look at the fact of his resurrection. Paul says that's an incontrovertible fact. You cannot argue with that. Now, there are people that try to do that, right? There are people that say that you believe fairy tales because you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Paul was a contemporary of Jesus. He was talking to people whose journalists spread this throughout the known world. This was an incontrovertible fact. There was more proof that Jesus was raised from the dead than George Washington ever lived. We were talking about that, right? The, his proclamation about Thanksgiving earlier today. Nobody doubts that, right? Anybody? Because You might want to check yourself into an institution if you don't believe that George Washington ever lived. There is more proof that Jesus was raised from the dead and that George Washington ever lived. Christ is at first fruits. He provides the means by which we know for certain that God has provided everything that we need for that resurrection to be ours for our life. And then he says this in verse 23, but each in his own order Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. Christ has been raised from the dead. That's the basis for this whole conversation already in Paul's day. This is all the proof that we need, the first fruits here. Uh, driving through Texas, get real familiar with mile markers, don't you? There's a lot of dead space between here and wherever I go, east, that is. And if you run out of gas there, this is just hypothetical, never done it. Just kidding, I won't admit to it, but I probably, if you run out of gas, sometimes the only thing that you can look at is a mile marker. Isn't it? There's nothing but grass, cactus, rocks, and a little green and white sign that the Department of Transportation has put up for you to know where you are. Christ's resurrection. Look, you can look all the way around you. You may have no other proof but the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, and you can know where you stand, where you are. He's the first mile marker, and that's where Paul is saying, this is what you look at. This is... This is where you focus. This is where you live your life. This is where you, how you know where you are. 
And this is how you know where we are in the chronology that Paul is laying out here. It's a, it's a general chronology, okay? And in Corinthians, Paul's not talking to the Green Beret Christians, if you will. Okay, he's not talking to the special forces believers. He's not talking to the, the people that are all gung-ho and ready to go and serve and love and sacrifice their lives. He says to them, guys, I would have talked to you as if you were spiritual, but you, you were fleshly. And actually, you're still fleshly, right? So he's not giving them all of the detail, all of the bullet points, all of the outline. That's in other places. This is general for his readers at this time. These are people that may not really be able to comprehend the specificity in other places. And Paul's not writing here primarily to, to give us an eschatology. He's not, he's not giving us the fullness of all the end times teaching. He, he's teaching about who Jesus is. He's teaching about his work, how his person and his work are guarantees of resurrection life for his readers. So we have to go other places. For more detail. One day we will. I know a lot of people keep asking when I'm going to do this or when I'm going to do that. and I'll get there. I will. I'll get there. I'll get to all of it if I get a chance. Y'all are going to wish you wish for something else when we're smack dab in the middle of Isaiah. I'm just, I'm just, or Ezekiel. You ever read through Ezekiel? There's a lot of figurative language there in Ezekiel and I can't draw. So I'm going to have to ask y'all to come up and draw the picture for me. Wheels flying in the air, that kind of thing. Anybody? Anybody want to, Bill, you draw? No, you don't draw. It's hard to draw Ezekiel out in stick figures. Let me just say, and I'm doing well to do stick figures. But this fits. Okay, this is not the precise outline, but it fits within the precise outline. And chronologically after that, right, nobody gets resurrected until Jesus does, yes? Jesus is the first fruits. Nobody's resurrected until Jesus does. He is the proof. He's the symbol. But Paul says Jesus has been resurrected. That has happened. And chronologically after that, those who are Christ at his parousia, his presence, sometimes called his appearing. That's uh, not sure if that's too specific or not specific enough. When he is present with them, when Jesus is present again, than these who are his. Parousia, I think, just means presence when Jesus is with them again. In that sense, in 1 John, it says, when we see him as he truly is, then we shall be like him. Scripture talks about the first resurrection and the second resurrection, about people who participate in it. But again, he's not giving us all that detail here. He's applying this to his readers. The second mile marker would be their own resurrection at Christ's presence. That's what they would have been interested in. At what point do I, as a, as a part of the church, take part in this plan in the end times? What capacity do I take part in it? Are you interested in that? I mean, hope so. It's important. It's hopeful happy thing, a blessed thing. Lots of people don't care. I hear a lot about what people, what the Bible says to do on Thursday. Whatever God wants you to do, do it. You have the spirit in you. Do it. Why don't we do an outreach on Thursday? Amen. Go do it. You know? If you want specificity instead of looking to the future and hopefulness and walking by the spirit, sometimes we have some specificity to give. The Corinthians would want to know this. What part do we play? And that's what Paul's given them. He says, that, and then after that, the end. There's no calendar involved there, by the way. <laughs> a few years ago, y'all who were still in El Paso would have seen billboards all over from a minute. Was it Family Life Ministries? Sounds so great, doesn't it? A beautiful family life. Who doesn't want a ministry about family life? In fact, a lot of churches would call this building out here the Family Life Center. Sure, we center on family life. That can't be a bad thing, can it? Yeah, that's okay, as long as you're not from the lands of fruit and nuts. I mean, not California, but I mean, just <laughs> metaphorically speaking. 
the guy decided it was sometime in April that Jesus was coming back. We were all going to be raptured. It didn't happen, right? Like 2011. Instead of retracting and correcting, going back to the Bible, what did he do? Oh, no, it, it happened. It happened? It did? Oh, it was, it was spiritual. It was spiritual. Stay away from that garbage. Just don't. Go there, right? There's no calendar involved. You, you, you can't get the Mayan calendar cross-referenced with a lunar Jewish calendar with the solar calendar mixed with the liturgical calendar and come out with a magic formula. And you wouldn't want to, actually. But from this point, the, the end is future. It's all guaranteed. Somewhere in between there is what we would call the, the rapture, the presence of Christ with his church, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 that from that point forward, we will be with him always. We're going to be able to see his hands and his feet. We're going to know what his face looks like. I go to a conference uh, every few years. They don't have it at this location anymore. It's a seminary in Fort Worth. And you walk in, and they have one of these cupola things. Is that how you say it? Cupola? Big sunroof kind of thing. You look up there, and they got portraits of all the apostles and Jesus. And they all look like rock stars from 1984. <laughs> you know what I mean? Ridiculous. We're going to know what Jesus actually looks like. Isn't that going to be beautiful? We're going to be with him forever from that point forward. It's the way Paul describes it. We will be with him always. And at the end, he says there is... There's a kingdom. We know that because Paul tells us here in Corinthians, he says that in the end, Christ will hand his kingdom over to God the Father. When he has abolished all earthly rule, authority, and power, all of his enemies, basically, everyone who has not been subject to the kingdom. Last week we were in Psalm 145, right? Some of y'all weren't here for it. But in the last verse that we looked at, Psalm 145, David says that your dominion is of all the ages. Some translations say eternity. Be careful with that. There's not nearly as many synonyms. This shouldn't surprise you. Anyway. I sound like a broken record. Y'all know what a broken record is? Guys that are younger than, under, than, under 20? We still use the, the picture. You don't know all this idea. A broken record repeats itself over and over and over. See the things we got to explain now? Man, over and over, repeated, 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 over and over and over and over. There's not nearly as many synonyms in Scripture as we purport that there are. Be careful when you see eternity, because sometimes the words that are underlying that translation don't actually mean eternity. And in Psalm 145, is one of those places, David extols the virtue of God's kingdom, God the Father's kingdom that is of all the ages. Throughout every single age, David understood that God is sovereign over all of human history. Yes, we'd all agree with that, is he not? He is in charge. He's the boss. He created it. He's in charge. That's what David is saying there. That's the kingdom of God. Uh, that can't be the kingdom that Paul is talking about here. You know why? Because God already has that kingdom. And Paul says that after this, at the end, Christ will hand over this kingdom to God, the Father. You ever had your hands full and somebody tried to hand you something? Extra? No? Well, last Sunday, we had our Thanksgiving feast. Is Norma in here? Norma came in with 16 pies at least. Like this. This is the image that I... I almost asked her, Norma, do you need another pie? Because she... I don't know how she opened the door. Right? If God already has his kingdom, Christ isn't going to hand him another. It's another entity. It's the kingdom of the Messiah. Christ's kingdom. Sometimes you'll hear it called the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth. This earth, by the way, that's important to acknowledge. A physical rule, 
on a physical throne in a physical city called Jerusalem. The promise that he gave to Israel, to David. Christ's kingdom doesn't come until after the rapture, after his parousia. That may not matter to you very much. Be honest. Does that, does that sound like it matters a whole lot to you? What do you think, Jacob? You're a Bible college student. Does it matter if Christ's kingdom is here or now or not? Sure it does. Sure it does. Here's why it matters. That was a trick. Sorry. I mean, I mean like this. Yeah, it matters. It's not here now. To some of you, that, as I said, that'll sound self-evident. To some of you, it'll sound ridiculous. That's okay. I wouldn't be the first guy to sound ridiculous from a pulpit to people, right? I won't be the last. To me, it's tremendously comforting, actually. The absence of Christ's kingdom in this world right now. You know why? Because I look around at the world and I say, if this is all Jesus has for us, what in the blazes are we going to do? What hope is there if this is the kingdom? And I want to tell you, there are the majority of people out there who teach the Bible in this world today believe that this is the kingdom, the church age, this time period, when Jesus isn't present on this earth physically. And this is the best he's got. Now, does that, now do you see why it might matter? Matters a whole lot. That we don't credit Christ with this garbage <laughs> that we put up with, quite frankly. With our political systems, our elections, our mess. We don't credit it to him. We would be blaming him for it. it it's tremendously comforting to me that, that this messed up world is not reflective of the physical, direct, righteous rule of Jesus Christ. Because, frankly, I'd expect a whole lot better. Yes? I would expect a whole lot better of it. Let's continue. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Christ's kingdom has this purpose. To reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. You can read about the ultimate fulfillment of this truth. In fact, let's turn over there. Revelation. You all know where that one is, right? I don't have to tell you that that's the last one in the book, right? Revelation. Revelation 20. Let's flip over there. This Bible still isn't broke in. It's a pretty new one. I had one for 20 years. I dropped it in a river. i been using it ever since. Right? And uh, the pages don't stick as much as this one. It's brand new. Let's start here. It says, when the thousand, verse 7, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the Holy One and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are also. And they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. The last enemy, he says in Revelation also, that will be abolished is death. Verse 14 says, when death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. See, this is another reason why it matters. The important thing to remember for us is that these things are things that Christ will do. It's his kingdom, and it's his victory. Jesus Christ will do it, not, not us. Uh, terrible things happen in our world when we take on the responsibility that Jesus has himself. Um, 
when we're talking about justification, it matters, right? It matters whether we see Jesus Christ's work as finished or not. Many people will tell you that Jesus Christ's work is finished, and then they will say, but you still got to work your butt off to prove that you're worthy of it. What does finished mean? Is the work finished? Is it completed? Is it done? You should be nodding your heads. Yes! Yes! It's completed. It's finished. It's done. He said so himself. It's absolutely done. We get in trouble when we try to insert ourselves into things that Christ has reserved for himself. We get in trouble when we try to bring a kingdom which Christ has reserved for himself to bring on his own. Christ will do it, and not us. Thank the Lord. Not a, a political party. Right? Not, not the Republicans. Not the Democrats. Not the Libertarians, the Constitution Party, the Green Party. I don't know how many candidates that got thrown up for an election here recently, for just for president. The Cotton Candy Party is probably in there somewhere. Really, they're all puffballs anyway. We call them all that. When we're talking about the kingdom. Not you, not me, not our church, not any church. Christ is going to do that himself. He's going to do it for us. He's given us instructions for the meantime, but we have to understand the implications of those instructions. It says in verse 27, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. Lots of pronouns there. We'll get to that. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. In his sovereignty, God has destined all things to be placed under the subjection of the Messiah's rule. Everything. Some of you... Uh, some of you might not buy into my distinction. Some of you might not care about my distinction. But those of you who care about it may not buy into it. That, that, let me explain. But between the kingdom of God and the, and the kingdom of Christ, there's, there's multiple different aspects to kingdom in Scripture. The way that Paul uses it here, though, they're clearly distinct. And he keeps it inviolable, actually, with these last two verses. He says here that all things, all created things, are brought into subjection under the Messiah Jesus Christ, in order that in handing over the Messiah's kingdom to God the Father, all things would be subject to the Father. That's God's plan. That's God's purpose. That is God's will, that everything would be fulfilled, that he would be all in all. So we're talking about what it, what it means for Christ to be king today. And, and part of that is understanding when and where and how his kingdom will be established. It, it means understanding that it is not now, not here. Y'all think I'm being silly, but there is a whole list of things that come when Christ is king. Not the least of which is power and glory. <laughs> not the least of which would be a little thing called the Mount of Olives splitting in two. Uh, not the least of which is a physical rule from Jerusalem. I mean, we all have phones now, right? We can all check those things. Those are not things that have happened. It matters. It matters a lot to know when, where, and how his kingdom will be established. It matters a lot that we understand that we have, that as believers we have a role in that kingdom, but that role is not present tense future. Uh, we are told that faithful believers will reign with him when he is reigning over his kingdom. The fact is that his kingdom and my role in that kingdom is future changes a lot of things. It, some people who think that the kingdom is now, think that that makes me a pessimist. 
you know, dispensationalists have that, uh, have that, that uh, reputation for saying, well, it's all going to burn anyway. We're not wrong. Are we? Now, that may be a little bit of an extreme attitude, that it's all going to burn anyway, but it is. <laughs> we're not wrong. It changes my expectations of the world. It changes my anxiety level, doesn't it? Brings it down a notch or a thousand, doesn't it? Brings down my expectations of our political process, of every country's political process, which is also important in our global world, that we live a global economy and that kind of thing. I, I don't have to tell you that Donald Trump isn't Jesus, right? Y'all didn't say that loud enough. I don't have to tell you all that Donald Trump isn't Jesus, right? Neither were any of the other guys in his position. None of his predecessors. See, that's only a problem if I expect the same things of him that I would expect of Jesus' reign. I don't. And I hope you don't either. Actually, we'd be pretty upset if the President of the United States did some of the things that King Jesus will do, wouldn't we? Would not be tolerated on either side of the aisle. Destroy all his enemies. Maybe we do need to take some picture, you know, take some of that under advisement. What a country is supposed to do. But the reason would be is that we don't trust any human leader the way we would trust King Jesus. We're not responsible for defeating Christ's enemies in this world. Not militarily. Not in the good old American way, economically. That's how we often push our weight around now. Internally and externally. Certainly not politically. That doesn't mean that a country doesn't have responsibilities to its citizens. Nations have responsibility, especially for how they treat Israel. And they're held accountable for that. It's not the same thing at all as expecting them to be the kingdom. You know, we're not even always capable of identifying Christ's enemies, are we? Not really. And in the last, I grew up with being friends with people. My parents weren't boycotters. Did y'all grow up with a bunch of boycotters? Or maybe y'all were boycotters. We all boycotters on us? I grew up with a lot of, a lot of boycotters around me. It never worked. Not once did it ever work. Lately, it's been, folks, the classic one here will be Starbucks. Buy your coffee elsewhere. Now, I happen to know that there are better cups of coffee in El Paso than Starbucks offers. I also happen to know that there are red-blooded Americans that serve coffee that welcome my sidearm. <laughs> so I don't go to Starbucks that often anyway. I know a lot of people that boycott them because it's, they're anti-Christian, they're anti-believers. Falls into the economic category, trying to defeat Christ's enemies with our wallets. Just ran into this the other day. I thought it had kind of died down. You know, again, I don't go in there because I'm an American, because I'm a Christian. But a lot of people don't go there because they believe of them as being enemies of Christ. I'm not sure that they know how to tell the difference because a lot of those same people who boycott Starbucks wouldn't buy a beer from a Christian company. Y'all know that there are Christians that started beer companies, right? Alec Guinness, Arthur Guinness, Samuel Adams. <laughs> Samuel Adams was a boy. Y'all don't believe me? Go look it up. Arthur Guinness saved a lot of people in his country by providing something safe to drink. Preventing cholera because he was an excellent brewmaster, God honoring believer who loved the Lord. So, listen, if you're going to boycott Starbucks, better have some Guinness in your fridge, huh? <laughs> if you don't like Guinness, you know, maybe some Samuel Adams. I'm from Texas, I prefer Shiner myself. I don't know if that's a but anyway, you know, see, you see what I mean? Like, we don't actually know how to, how to decide who's, 
who's the enemy and who's our, who's our ally. People who, who boycott things and think that they're supposed to defeat the enemies of Christ um, have a real problem. They don't know how to defi- decide who's who and what's what. They're just kind of angry. And that can I tell you that a life lived in anger is probably not productive at all. We don't have to defeat Christ's enemies. Praise the Lord. He's perfectly capable of doing that himself. We don't have to create, initiate, or maintain his kingdom. Praise the Lord. You know how many times you have to modify just a simple piece? I mean, we're only talking 70,000 pages of simple legislation. Can you imagine, depending on Congress... To bring the kingdom of Jesus. Hopeless. But you can have hope in Jesus. When he comes, he'll bring it. We can love him for that and hope in that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. We thank you for these promises. We thank you that the things that Jesus has reserved for himself, he accomplishes entirely. We thank you that these things are not dependent on us, but only dependent on his faithfulness. We love you. We thank you most of all for your son himself, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.